So I've got the word this morning. I'm going to get in Psalms today. We're going to jump into that Psalms chapter 133, verse 1. Psalm 133, verse 1. If you want to stand for the reading of the word this morning, let's do that. Psalm 133, verse 1. If you are there, give me an amen. All right, amen, yeah. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. We're going to stop right there in that verse. And Father, we just thank you for your word today, Jesus. I thank you, Father, today for speaking to our hearts, just giving us clarity and revelation and Lord, I thank you for a spirit of unity just breaking out in this place today, God. Lord, I thank you for walls of vision, division being crumbled, Father, being torn down, separation, Father. Lord, that understanding that we have union with you and, and each other today, Jesus. So I just thank you, Father, today for us being forever changed in your presence, presence this morning and by your word today, Father. And we just thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the text this morning, it says God will command a blessing on any people that dwell together in unity. And I don't know about you, but today I'm believing for a spirit of unity to break out in this place. I'm, I'm believing for every wall of di division to be crumbled, every wall of separation to come crashing down. It says this, behold, how great, good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. For it says, for there God commands a blessing, life evermore. It's interesting it says the word behold in the text today because that's not really a word we use in our language today. It's not like we're be say behold, there's a, there's a sale at Kohl's. We don't really say that. It's not something we say in our language, you know, like behold. But it says behold. What it really means is like pay attention. There's something going on here. You need to fix your gaze upon this. This is important. This is something that's not normal. You need to look at this. Behold, and how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And it's interesting how he uses good and pleasant in front of unity. In other words, he's saying it's inexhaustible. You can't figure out how good it really is. It's that good. It's that great. It's like the best. It's kind of like maybe you could compare it. Maybe if you like going to the beach and going to the ocean and you finally get there on your vacation and you step out on the beach and you see the water and you're, you just breathe in. And it's like, man, this is so good. Unless you're like me and you get burnt on the first day and you have to wear a T-shirt and be under the umbrella the rest of the week. That's not good, but that's normally my experience because I don't take sun very well. But other than that, it's, it's good. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is good. If we could get to that place in unity in our lives, maybe in our, our marriage and say, and we look at each other and say, you know what? I couldn't believe it's this good. I can't believe it's this good and this pleasant. Or maybe in our workplace where we say, I can't believe it's this good. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And it says, for there, God will command a blessing. Life forevermore. The there he's talking about is not Mount Hermon. It's not a geographical location. But the there is a place of unity. God says where any place, any people dwelling together in unity, he says, I'm going to bless that. I'm going to command a blessing upon that. It's no wonder the enemy wants to divide us. He wants to bring division in our families, in our nation, in our churches. He wants to bring separation. He wants to, us to fight against one another. Maybe on Facebook, I went there, I said it today. For us to fight against one another, pit up against one another, arguing about whether we should wear a mask or not wear a mask. And I'm not saying these are legitimate issues, but we've got to elevate ourselves to a kingdom perspective. There's a lot of chaos going on all around us. And we look from that perspective, what we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, we can see above all the chaos, all above the demonic principalities of this world and see from God's perspective. He wants to bring division in our lives because any people that dwell in unity, there is a blessing, commanded blessing on that place. And right now we're being challenged by the age of divisiveness, right? The way of the world is to be divisive, to separate, 
to build bar barriers and separation. That's the whole motivation, I think, of media. Can I get a witness? The whole motivation of politics, when we try to pigeonhole and classify people to create contention between groups of people. But not only does it happen in the secular world, it can happen in the church world, in the Christian world. Why is that? Because the forces of darkness understand that if we get united, we're an unstoppable force. There is no stopping us. You can't stop us. When we lock arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, you cannot stop us. We are an unstoppable force. But when we're divided, we're deluded. When we're divided, we're marginalized. But when we're united, all hell begins to shake. And I think it's time for hell to start shaking. I'm tired of the, some of the stuff's going on in our world around us today. We need to unite and link up together. It is time for hell to start shaking. We have power and authority in our lives that God has given us. And if we're going to impact the world, we can't do it divided. We can't do it in schisms. We can't do it that way. We can't do it divided. Jesus said a house divided against itself cannot stand. That's talking about a national house. That's talking about a church house, a natural house. Any kind of house divided against itself cannot stand. You know what the greatest threat against our nation is today? It's not the coronavirus. It's not, what do they call it, the murder hornets? I haven't really seen those. I don't know if that's what you call them or not. I mean, 2020 has been a crazy year. It's like we're living out all these sci-fi movies or something like that. Thankfully, Will Smith didn't have to save us on Independence Day. I'm glad that one didn't come true. Whatever's coming forth in 2020, it's been a crazy year. None of these things, it's not the Russians, it's not the Chinese, it's not terrorism. The greatest threat to our nation is internal division. When one man pits himself up against the other, that is the greatest threat in our nation today. The greatest threat to the church today is not demonic forces because God said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But the greatest threat to the church is when we live in discord and division and separation, when we're living in strife because a house divided against itself cannot stand. That's why the enemy wants to bring separation. If I can divide, I can stop what's trying to be built can divide, bring separation. He wants to bring separation between brother and brother, sister and sister, parents and children, teenagers and parents. He's trying to bring division between race, white, black, Hispanic. Can I just say this today? There's only one human race. There's different expressions, different ethnicities from one human race, but there's only one human race. The Bible says from one blood, all people were made. One blood, all people were made. That means if there's a white man in the hospital, in the emergency room, and he needs blood, and a black man gives him his blood, he's going to save his life. Vice versa, if a black man's in the emergency room, and a white man gives blood, he's going to save his life. Because it says from one blood, he made all people. One race. He's trying to divide races. He's trying to divide us generationally. Young and old, trying to divide us with our worship styles. What time we start church? I've seen church splits over pianos. Crazy enough. I mean, the piano was like from early 1900. The thing didn't even play. Half the keys didn't even work. They got stuck on there, and it, you couldn't keep the thing in tune. So if you tried to sing with it, it was just terrible. But bringing in a new piano that didn't get out of tune, some people are like, no, we're not doing that. That's great. Grandma's piano she played that it's holy we feel the presence of God when that thing plays and even though it sounds terrible he tries to split us over the craziest stuff political parties Republican or Democrat libertarian all those things he tries to divide us husbands and wives he tries to divide us you realize even though you are in one place that doesn't mean you're in unity you can be dwelling but not together Jesus said this, if any two or three gather together in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. The key word is together. Gather together. See, we can be a gathering today, but we may not be together. We can be dwelling in our homes with our family, but maybe not be 
together. The power of unity is when we learn how to dwell together. Together. So we need to learn how to incorporate unity and identify unity in our lives. I think sometimes it's kind of hard to, to pinpoint it, but we, we know what it's not. I mean, when you walk in a room and the environment, the atmosphere is kind of tense, there might be relational tension, and you don't know what to say, and it's kind of awkward, you, you know what disunity looks like. I mean, you walk into the room and people are talking, and all of a sudden they stop and they start talking about the weather and sports, and then they realize, you realize they were talking about you. Anybody ever had that happen to them? We know what that looks like. But unity, it has a powerful effect when it's positive, but it has a negative effect when it's toxic. It can be toxic because unity is neutral. You give it a direction. You tell it which way to go, whether it's beneficial or detrimental. And God gives us this example in Genesis 11. He gives us an illustration. He begins to talk about a people that begin to build a tower that's reaching towards heaven. I'm going to read this real quick here in Genesis 11, verse 1 through 6. And it says this, One time all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used in mortar. Then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united, and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. They were people that were united. Nothing that they set out to do would be impossible for them. So in other words, as long as they kept speaking the same thing, kept moving the same direction, nothing was impossible for them. There was no limitations. God makes a blanket statement in the power of unity. He says when it's used as an instrument to move things forward, there was no limitation of what you can do. For anybody who moves in unity, nothing is impossible for them. He's making a a blank statement here. Just imagine what a husband and wife, if they get on the same page, what it would look like in their life. Nothing would be impossible. Unstoppable force. Or in a business where the employees, where the, the boss and the employees get on the same page in alignment, speaking the same thing, dreaming the same thing, trying to accomplish the same thing. Nothing is impossible for them. Or maybe the body of Christ, when we get on the same page and in alignment, we start focusing on the same thing, the same mission, dreaming about the same thing, speaking the same thing. There's nothing impossible for us in the body of Christ. We become an unstoppable force. Nothing is impossible for them to set out to do anything. There's no limitations. Those are in unity. That's what he gives us this picture here. And throughout the scripture, we see in Acts that we're one accord. The church of Acts is one accord in in one mind. They, they had this unity. And I think the greatest miracle was that they got along after the cross and the resurrection. They actually genuinely loved each other because before that they were fighting with one another. Who was going to be the greatest? Who was going to be the best? That's all the disciples argued about. But after that, it says they were in one accord. It's a miracle. Besides the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, man, this is a true miracle. They genuinely love one another. They were in one accord. You see this in Acts 1.14 where they're praying in one accord. They're waiting in the upper room for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it shows us all the people that are there. There are 120 people. Actually, after the resurrection, there was 500 people, but we don't know what happened to the other 380. They might have went to the coal sale. I don't know. They got lost somewhere in translation. But now there's only 120 people. And it tells us who's there. There's Jesus' mother, Mary. There's the other women supporters. There's the brothers of Jesus that were there that didn't believe that he was the Messiah. And now they have the realization that the Messiah grew up in his, their house. I mean, can you imagine waking up to that realization that Jesus is actually the Messiah and you were his brother? I'd probably have some regrets and be like, man, I... I shouldn't have done those wet willies that many times. You know, I'm like, well, that's Jesus is the Messiah. I can imagine waking up to that realization. And here's the disciples, three and a half years walking with Jesus, fighting with one another. They have all these these issues. I mean, these people had a lot of issues in life together. And we don't know if they worked out 
their issues before the prayer meeting or during the prayer meeting. But it says they're in one accord. And it goes on to say in Acts chapter 2 that they were in one accord in one place. And suddenly there was a rushing mighty wind and the outpouring of the Spirit came and they were filled. So you can be in one place but not in one accord. They were in one place and one accord and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. There was something supernatural that happened when they gathered in that way. You see it in Acts chapter 4. They continue being in one accord where Paul and Peter, they come back after being threatened by the government for speaking Jesus' name. And they come back and tell the community, the people, what's going on. And they're like, well, I'm just praying for you, brother. Hopefully the Lord shows up. You're on your own. Bless you, brother. The government's all against you. They're like, no, no, no. Your burden is my burden. Your victory is my victory. And they begin to lift up their voice and one accord. And when they did that, the power of God fell down and they were filled with the Spirit again. That place where they were gathered was shaken. It was shaken when they gathered together. One accord began to lift up their voice to God. You know what's going to shake our region, shake our area when Christians stop nitpicking one another, stop being divisive, stop living in discord, and begin to lift up their voices in one accord. And that place where we're gathered, it is going to be shaken by the power of God. Because I believe the greater the unity, the greater the power. That's where prison doors are open. The miraculous begins to happen. Blind eyes begin to see. Chains are broken in people's eyes. People don't have to go through rehab for 20 weeks. They are instantly set free from addiction. I believe the greater the unity, the greater the power that is released. Jesus said, well, know you're my disciples, not because of your common doctrinal statement. He said, you'll, you'll know you're my disciples not because of your worship styles. He said, they'll know you're my disciples, not because you gather every Sunday at 1030. That's not it. He said, they'll know you're my disciples because the people by nature should not be connected. There's There's a people by nature that should not be together, but something supernatural has brought of people with different backgrounds and and different life backgrounds brought them together that should not be together. He said, they will know you're my disciples because the love that you have for one another. They'll know that you are mine because the love that you have for one another. And they're going to look at that and say, you know what? I want that. I want what you have, that love that you have. And it's attractive to pull people in. They'll come running to the body of Christ and say, you know what? I want that kind of love that you have. He said, they'll know that you are mine for the love that you have for one another. I'm praying that we fall deeper in love with one another, that we love each other as Christ has loved us, that we genuinely love each other other because that is the glue that holds us together is the love of God inside of each and every one of us. He said they'll know that you are mine because of the love that you have for one another. You know the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, it's not really the Lord's Prayer, even though we call it that. It's actually the disciples prayer. Because disciples are with Jesus. They're like, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Show us how to pray. And he gives them this prayer and says, pray this. Most of us know it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Most of us know that. But the Lord's prayer is actually found in John 17. This is really the Lord's prayer. This is his last request. This is everything to him. This is everything that's on his heart is found in John 17. This is really the Lord's prayer. And I want to read this. John chapter 17, verse 15, it says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me to the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for the saints, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through the word. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are me, and I and you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave, gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. And them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus is praying. This is the Lord's prayer. This is what's on Jesus' heart. This is his last requests. He's praying, Father, don't take them out of the world. 
Even though they're trying to vacate it, Lord, I pray that you don't do that. Keep them in the world. I've sent them into the world. Lord, I pray that you sanctify them by your, your truth. And Lord, as I am in you and you are in me and we are one, I pray that they would be one just as we are one. That is Jesus' prayer. And he said, then the world will believe and know that the, you have sent me. He said, I've given you my glory. What is his glory? It's a manifestation, manifestation presence of God, is his Holy Spirit that he's given us inside of each and every one of us. That is his glory, his Holy Spirit that he's given us that joins us together. Wherever you see true unity, it's because the Holy Spirit is having influence on those individuals' lives. He's given us his glory, his, his spirit inside of each and every one of us. Well, that is his prayer that we would be one just as he and the Father are one. That's his prayer. It's on Jesus' heart. You know, unity is not uniformity. A lot of people understand unity is fighting for uniformity. But true unity requires diversity. We know the scripture that a man shall join his wife and the two shall become one. There is diversity, but yet one. True unity requires diversity. Unity doesn't just tolerate Diversity, but it celebrates diversity. And our strength is not in our uniformity, but our strength is in our diversity. I want to read this out of Romans chapter 12, verse 3. It says, Romans 12, verse 3, it says, For I say, I'm sorry, I'm going to start with verse 4. It says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. In prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in ministering. He who teaches and teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Unity celebrates diversity. It's what it celebrates. If everybody was like me, you'd have a way overdose of me. That would not be good. But we need people that are givers, people that are compassionate, people that are merciful, people that exhortate one another, people that are encouragers, people that do all kinds of things that nobody else can do. We need administrative people. We need all kinds of people, diversity, to move the kingdom forward, to advance the kingdom. We need each other. We are many members in one body. Even though we are one, we are diverse. We are just wired different. We have different anointings and different callings and different abilities, and, and we should celebrate one another's differences, that I'm not you and, and you are not me, and, and we are different in the body of Christ because true unity celebrates diversity. Many members put in one body. In Psalms, it talks about, it likens unity to like a precious oil of the anointing that's flowing down Aaron's beard onto his garments. You know, the, the anointing oil just isn't made of olive oil, but it has like different ingredients in it. It has like cinnamon and like myrrh and acacia and all these different ingredients in it. And you have to put like 250 shekels of this in it and 250 shekels of this in it. It's, it's got all this mixture that makes up the anointing, the fullness of it. So you might have a little spice and I might have a little spice. And when we, we, we come together and mix, there's a fullness of the anointing that is released that touches everybody's lives. When we come together, the mixture of us all, true unity requires diversity. Not only that, but unity is not something that you and I create. It's not something you and I create. It's already in existence. We can't create it. It's a gift from God. Our job is to value the gift and to protect the gift. We cannot create it. It says, preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. One translation says, make every effort. Do everything possible that you can. Make it a priority to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So that means if you need to forgive somebody, forgive them. 
Do whatever you need to do to keep the unity of the Spirit. We don't create it. God creates it, but it's our job to guard it, to preserve it, to nurture it, to protect it, and to value it. That is our responsibility. God's the one who gives us the gift of unity. We don't create it, but we've got to nurture it and protect it. What really establishes unity is not just us agreeing on doctrine. Ephesians 5 says he's perfecting us until the unity of the faith, which means it's a process. You know, agreement is not required for unity. It's not the basis for our unity. But the basis of our unity is that Jesus is Lord over our life. That that is the central focal point, that Jesus is the Lord over our lives. Because unity is a product of the Spirit. It's greater than uniformity. It's greater than that because we're connected at a deeper level. If I don't understand what you're thinking or agree, maybe what you're thinking, what's going on in your head, we're, I can't walk away from you because we're still connected in a greater level. Because most people only walk in unity as long as they agree. Then they walk away from one another once they disagree. But unity out of the Spirit, I can't walk away from you because I'm not just connected to your head. I'm connected to your heart. There's a deeper level of connection. And I, even though we don't agree, I can still love you and we can still walk in unity. You, agreement is not the basis for unity, but we're connected at a deeper level. We talked about this on Wednesday night. Actually, Peter, I think, gave this illustration of unity being like a triangle. And I've officiated wed- weddings and I normally use this illustration that in a triangle, like Jesus is at the top. And when we come together, we move, reach towards him. When we do that, we come closer together in the process. We come closer together. When we reach towards him, when we make him the focal point of our lives, when he's Lord of our life, and we reach towards him, we come closer together. What connects us is the spirit of Christ in you and the spirit of Christ in me. That's really what joins us together. And we got to keep Jesus at the center of it all to keep it there. Can we be a church that keeps Jesus at the center of it all? And say, you know what? You're the Lord of my life. Whatever you want to do, whatever you're doing, we are going to do it. I don't think we should be just a church of what we're against or even what we're for, but we're going to say, Jesus, you're the Lord over our life. And whatever you're doing, we are going to get in the middle of it and do it. We're going to do it. See, the real effect of unity is a blessing that God commands on it. In that place, I command blessing. That is the effect of unity. If you want blessing in your home, keep strife and discord out of the front door. It's not coming here. I know it's easier said than done. It's not coming here because we're going to live under that blessing, that command of blessing that nobody can take away. What would it look like if the atmosphere of your home was unity? What could you not do? Be an unstoppable force. What would it look like if our businesses, the atmosphere was an atmosphere of unity? What could we not do? What would it look like in our churches if we had such a spirit of unity in the atmosphere? What could we not do? We become an unstoppable force. What would we be like if we were people that say, you know what, I'm going to preserve, I'm going to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I just want to challenge you with that, that we be that kind of people, that we make every effort, that we preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Whatever we got to do to lay it down, my agenda, my, my rights, my will, that this is priority in my life. And I believe when we do that, there's a greater unity, there's a greater power that is released in our midst when we walk this out of unity. I believe in that God is wanting to release this spirit of unity, that we be unified like never before, and that we lay down the offenses, lay down the division and the walls that separate us until the only thing left is Jesus. It's all that's left, and he'd be the center of it all. I just want to pray for us this morning. You want to stand this morning?
Well, Father, this morning, if you just want to lift up your hands today, I would have you join arms and hands, but I know we're trying to do, try not to have as much contact right now. Father, we just say this morning, we just get our voice in alignment with your voice, Lord, that we want to be one, Lord, with one another and with you. That is your heart's cry. That is your prayer. That is you and the Father one that you want us to be one. So I thank you, Father, for unity today. Father, that it's not just something that we pray, but it's followed up with action, Lord God, that we do whatever we can to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So this morning, we just lay down our fences. We lay down just the walls of separation. I thank you for breaking every wall of separation, breaking every schism, Lord, every barrier. Lord, that they come crumbling down, everything that's divisive, Lord. Father, I thank you for breaking down and tearing down every single wall, everything, so all that's left is you, Jesus. That you become the central focal point of everything. That you are Lord of our lives, God. You are what matters, God. Lord, this morning we just get our eyes fixed upon you. I think as we draw closer to you, we're going to draw closer to one another, and we're going to start speaking the same things. Lord, you're going to reveal things by your Spirit to our hearts of what you're doing and where you're moving us and directing us, Father. Lord, so this morning, we just, we just want whatever you want today. Whatever you're doing, we're going to jump in the middle of that. And I thank you today. We're, we're choosing to lock arms, join hands, and say we are the united body of Christ today. Lord, I think that we are an unstoppable force, a mighty army. The enemy doesn't stand a chance against and so I thank you today for a spirit of unity like never before, God. So we just surrender ourselves today to you, Jesus. Surrender our will, our agenda. Lord, it's not about us. We put we over me today. Any selfishness, selfish ambition, Lord, we leave that today at your, your feet this morning, God. And I thank you for opening our eyes this morning, seeing from your perspective today, or what you're doing in this world. So today we just lock arms in the spirit. And I thank you today for us falling deeper in love with one another like never before. That the world will see the love that we have and say, I want that. I want that. So I thank you today, Jesus, for your spirit, your presence this morning. If there's anybody that says, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior today. I just want you to lift up your hand. Pray for you today. Amen. And Father, I thank you today for your people. Thank you for this, these mighty sons and daughters that are bold, that are courageous. Would I bless them today? Would I thank you that wherever we go, Lord, you're with us. And thank you for just the residue of just being caught by people around us, being attracted to us as we leave this place today, Father. So we thank you today that we are a mighty army, a mighty force in you today. And I thank you today for uniting us. And Lord, we just make you the central focal point of our lives, the center of everything, of it all, Jesus. And I just bless your people today. Lord, we bless you. We love you today, Jesus. In your mighty name, amen, amen.